In Jesus' name we pray. Father, we thank you for our leaders, our workers who are here today. We're asking, Lord, that your word will enrich every life, even today in Jesus' name. Bless everyone without exception. And we pray, Lord, you'll prepare every one of us for the kingdom of God. And between now and that time of the kingdom, all our needs will be supplied in Jesus' name. And let the joy of the Lord be the strength of your people. Speak to your people today again. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. God bless you. Consider in the blessing of the Lord. We're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 1. And I'm reading from verse 6. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 6. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up, awaken the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, was abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles for which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed for I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. And the church said, Amen. Amen. We're reading the writings of Paul the Apostle. Paul the Apostle was once a sinner, a persecutor, an injurious person, a blasphemous person. But as God who is faithful, and God who is merciful, and God who is kind and loving, loves everyone. He knew he was walking in ignorance, and so he called him. And thank God, he responded to that call. And from the moment of Paul's conversion, his mind was on heaven. You know why? The voice came to him from heaven. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And then Saul replied and said, Lord, he knew it was the Lord talking from heaven. Who art thou? And he said, I am Jesus. And from that time he knew that the Lord had spoken to him from heaven. He surrendered to the Lordship of Christ without any reservation. Think about that. That he surrendered heart, soul, mind, body, life, time, treasure, everything to the lordship of jesus christ without any reservation god's grace in his life produced a dramatic change he was truly a new creature in christ the transformation in his life was so clear for everyone to see his old associates witnessed the indisputable unarguable change of heart, change of spirit, change of soul, change of character, change of life, change in his pursuit in life. The believers also in the whole church saw the definite undeniable evidence of genuine conversion and everyone glorified the Lord on his behalf. And later, he was even taken to heaven. And he saw the glory of heaven. 
And his constant desire since that time was that he'll be prepared for heaven, he'll get to heaven, and eventually he got there like he'll get there in Jesus' name. His conversion is an example for us. The transformation of his life was an example for us. And the life we live, purposeful life, a pointed life, a pungent life, a life that was concentrated and focused on getting to heaven is an example for you and for me. And he never, never forgot that this is the reason why he was saved and the reason why he came to the kingdom. And the Lord Jesus said, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. I'm looking at John chapter 3 verse 8 John chapter 3 verse 8 the wind bloweth where it listeth and thou hearest the sound thereof but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth look at this so is everyone that is born of the spirit the wind of the sweet blew to Paul the apostle he was all there his life was changed. His life was refreshed. His life was transformed. And he didn't know where the spirit was coming from or where the spirit was going. He didn't know the person before him and the person after him that the spirit of the Lord will grab and take hold of and transform and change. And, but he knew he came to him and he did a great transformation work in his life. And Jesus said, so is everyone that is born of the spirit. In that generation, in this generation, the generations to come, everyone that is born of the Spirit of God, your associates will know that something has happened to you. Even your enemies will know that something has happened unto you. And Paul the Apostle never stopped giving testimony about the great change and the great transformation that happened to him. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 22. Acts chapter 22, and I'm reading from verse 6. In Acts chapter 22, verse 6, and it came to pass that as I made my journey, I was come near unto Damascus about noon. Suddenly there shone from heaven. You see that? There shone from heaven a great light round about me. And I fell unto the ground and I heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? He knew it was Lord, capital L. He knew it's the Lord himself. And he, because he was speaking from heaven and he said, But what's your name? Him apart from your title and he said unto me he said unto me I had it myself I am Jesus of Nazareth whom thou persecutest and they that were with me saw indeed the light and they were afraid but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me because it was me it was directed to and I said what shall I do Lord he surrendered his life what shall I do Lord he submitted his life what shall I do Lord every sin within him now is knowledge is skill is ability is experience everything he put at the feet of Jesus and he said what shall I do Lord and the Lord said unto me arise and go going to Damascus and there shall be told thee all things, all things which are appointed for thee to do. And then the change was not a private change. When you are born again, the change is not private. When you are converted, the change is not private. It was a public thing, a well-known thing. Galatians chapter 1. In Galatians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 21. Galatians chapter 1. Verse 21, afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I, I was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, but they had heard only, the testimony spread everywhere, they had heard only. Everybody talk, talk, talked about it. They spoke about it. Look at what happened to Saul. That he which persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which he once destroyed. A dynamic change. A definite change that happened unto him. And it says in verse 24, And he glorified 
God in me. And then after that, after that time, uh, apart from just hearing the word from heaven, the Lord from heaven speaking to him, challenging him, that turned him around and that converted him, uh, he was transported to heaven. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. It says, I have not just one vision, visions of the Lord, revelations of the Lord. I knew a man talking about himself. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell. Or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows such and one cut up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man talking about himself. Whether in the body, I cannot tell. Or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows what he means by that is whether my spirit was just taken away from me uh, to visit heaven and come back to my body on earth, that I cannot tell. Or whether my totality, my body, my soul, my spirit, everything transported to heaven, I cannot tell. All I know is that I was there. I've been there. Look at verse 4. How he was caught up into paradise and had unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter of such and one will I glory yet of myself ordinarily I will not glory but in my infirmities for though I would desire to glory I should not be I shall not be a fool for I will say the truth uh, but now I forbear lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be or that he heareth of me. And then he goes on to say uh, something was happening. Buffeting came, the persecution came uh, so that he'll not be exalted above measure. And then he prayed to the Lord. Look at verse 9. Uh, and he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. Persecution, my grace is sufficient for thee. Trial, my grace is sufficient for you. Opposition, my grace is sufficient for you. And he says, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I pray that power rest upon you. And since that time, every day, he knew that there was heaven. And he knew he was on his way to heaven. Every step, every day, every moment, he'll think about heaven and his life, his labor. Everything he did was towards that purpose. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 21. Philippians chapter 1 verse 21. For me to live is Christ and to die is game. His mind was there. His heart was there. Everything he thought about was that heavenly place, heavenly glory, and the pleasure, and the please, everything that will happen. That's why it says in verse 22, But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I know not. I what not, for I am in a straight betwixt you, having a desire to depart, and to be with Christ, which is far better he said when I leave this place the moment I close my eyes here I'm on the other side I'm in paradise and with Christ already and he said that is far better but in verse 24 nevertheless to abide in the flesh is more needful for you and I have in this confidence I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for the fortress and joy of faith you see that Paul the apostle he had an unwavering consecration unto Christ as an unashamed heaven bound pilgrim he desired the same spiritual state the same spiritual standing and the same spiritual commitment and the same spiritual surrender for timothy and for each of us is saying the things that happen to me the experiences of God and the pursuit I have and the dedication I have and the perseverance I have, Timothy, that's exactly what I want for you. And then by extension for the rest of us, and I pray that what we'll see in Paul the Apostle, we'll see before we're going to see today, everything will be transferred into every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Are you there? I said it will be transferred to you in Jesus' name. I'm talking to you today on the consecration of unashamed 
heaven bound pilgrims. Unashamed, heaven bound pilgrims. Think about that. A pilgrim, a person that knows this place is not my home. I'm on, I'm on a journey and I'm going to that eternal city. A person who thinks like that, a person who talks like that, a person who plans like that, a person is always thinking, I'm a pilgrim. I'm a pilgrim. Is going to have a different kind of life. Not only that, and heaven bound pilgrim. A person that has set heaven in his sight every time, and he knows, that's my home. That's my goal. That's my pursuit. That's my destiny. That's the place I'm going. Is in heaven bound pilgrim. Not only that, he has cast off shame. The shame of following the Lord. The shame of the gospel. And the shame of suffering and the shame of whatever people may do against him is cast off the shame, is unashamed, is heaven bound. Of course, such a person will have consecration, commitment, sacrifice, surrender. And that's what we're looking at today, the consecration of unashamed Heaven bound pilgrims. There are three things we are talking about. Number one, acknowledging the grace of God by faith. Acknowledging the grace of God by faith. Number two, awakening the gift of God without fear. Awakening the gift of God without fear. Number three, affirming the gospel in all its fullness affirming the gospel in all its fullness we're coming to number one acknowledging the grace of god by faith come back to second timothy chapter one and we're reading from verse nine it tells us in verse nine it says who has saved us salvation comes by grace and called us with an holy calling. That calling comes by grace. Not according to our own works. Not according to our own marriage. Not according to any self-righteousness. Not according to any keeping of the ritual ceremonial law. But according to his own purpose. He has a purpose in every world's salvation. Purpose and grace. You see that? It's now acknowledging uh, the grace of God. Am I saved? I acknowledge the grace of God. As he called me, I acknowledge the grace of God. Am I in the kingdom? I acknowledge the grace of God, which was given us. He said not only to me, that grace given to us in Christ Jesus, even before the world began, but is now made manifest. What he's saying is the plan of salvation before the world began. And that grace to be given out before the world began. But is now manifested unto us by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death. He has abolished death. He has canceled death. I said he has canceled death. That eternal death will not be on the people who are born again, who are saved because Christ died for them. And because Christ died for us, he became a substitute. The final sacrifice and our savior. And because he's that final substitute, he has abolished death and he has brought life and immortality, eternal life to light through the gospel. And he's always rejoicing. Paul, the apostle, if you know him, he was always rejoicing in that grace of God. He said, I don't merit this. I don't deserve this. I don't qualify for this. I look at my past. I look at my life. What could I qualify for except for punishment? What could I qualify for except for eternal suffering but I'm not qualified for salvation only by the grace of God am I saved we're coming to 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 14 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 14 and the grace of our Lord was exceeding 
abundance with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. He said, look at how far I had gone and look at the terrible things I'd done and look at what a criminal I was. Look at how injurious I was and look at how blasphemous I was and can you ever imagine that a person like me will be converted but for the grace of God. Can you ever imagine that there will be a change, a transformation for a life like mine but for the grace of God. And it says, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant, exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. You'll accept this one. I said you accept it one that if God could show mercy to that man, he showed mercy to you. If God could have grace flowing to the life of that man to forgive him and to cleanse him and to forget his past and to transform his life and to change a man from a persecutor to a preacher, that same grace available today, it will turn your life around. That's why it says it's a faithful same and it's worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world for the purpose of saving sinners, to save sinners of whom I am chief. He said, if the greatest of sinners can be converted, the smallest of sinners will be converted. The young will be converted. The old will be converted. And everyone, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, shall be saved in Jesus' name. And Paul, he, he makes it transfer now in a beautiful way. He's been talking about himself. I got the grace of God. I enjoy the grace of God. I enjoy the goodness of God. I enjoy the love and the mercy of God. But I transfers it to you. It's coming to you now. I said the mercy is coming to you now. And the grace is coming to you now. And as you make up your mind and say, I'm going to surrender my life to Christ. Like Paul the Apostle did, everything he did for him, through him, he'll do through you in Jesus' name. In verse 16, how be it for this cause I obtain mercy. That in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern. To them that shall hereafter believe on him to life eternal. And when that grace comes, I, I, I showed you already the change and the transformation. Dynamic change, dynamic transformation that took place in the life of Paul the Apostle. And the same for everyone. Nobody can say, well, I've got grace, but no change, no transformation. Yes, it brings change. Because that grace will always work out salvation in us. It tells us in chapter 2 of, of Titus. Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 11. Grace comes to you. It will not leave you the way you were. It will transform your life. It will change your life. Grace is not just you know, like a license to go and be living in sin. Grace is not license to go on and be the way you were before. Grace rescues you. Grace cleanses you, and grace changes you, and grace transforms you, and grace turns your life around. He did it for Paul the Apostle, and Paul the Apostle said, I am a pattern. I am a pattern. When grace comes into somebody's life, that is something coming from heaven, and coming to your life here on earth, there will be a definite change. I said there will be a definite change. There will be a dynamic change. And your enemies will see that something has happened to you. They'll talk about you. I said they'll talk about you. And they say, I knew him before. That man is no more the same. That woman is no more the same. That boy, that girl is no more the same. May transformation be confirmed in your life in Jesus' name. Titus chapter 2 verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation. What does grace bring? Tell me out loud salvation the grace of god that bringeth salvation has appeared unto how many people now unto all men all of us who are here the grace of god is appearing to you and look at verse 12 teaching us grace teaching us grace it, it, it's not a, you know it's not a, just a patting us at the back and grace is not tolerating sin in our lives it says it's teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws we should live how do we live soberly righteously godly when i said when tell me out loud when 
in this present world. And now we're looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Look at this. Who gave himself for us? Who gave himself for me? Who gave himself for me? Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from how many iniquities? All iniquity, the salvation, the salvation. And this is even now going to sanctification and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. That's what the grace of God does in our lives. And that grace will keep on manifesting and manifesting everywhere you go in Jesus' name. For Paul the Apostle, and for Timothy, and for every one of us in the kingdom, it is all of grace. Salvation, that's all of grace. New life, that's all of grace. The change of heart, that's all of grace. Transformation of character, it's all of grace. Victory over temptation, it's all of grace. Sanctification, it's all of grace. And holiness, it's all of grace. Faithfulness, it's all of grace. Faithfulness to your family, husband faithful to the wife. The wife faithful to the husband is the result of salvation and it is by grace. Faithfulness in your place of work. You will not cheat anymore because things, the old uh, kind of a system, everything it pass away and you are not totally new and you are faithful to your employers. It is all of grace. You are faithful in your community. You are faithful everywhere and you are faithful to your friends and you are faithful in the church and to the church. It is all of grace. It is the grace of God And then you are faithful in ministry They are called into the ministry like Paul the Apostle He was called to salvation And to sanctification And then to service And you remain faithful You are going to be faithful I said you remain faithful And you will not uh, take the grace of God In vain In Jesus name uh, Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6 Verse 1 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we're reading from verse 1. It says in verse 1, it says, We then, as workers together with him, with God, beseech you also that she receive, tell me the rest of that verse. You receive not, tell me, tell me. You receive not the grace of God in vain. Somebody was stealing before, and he says, I have the grace of God now, and I'm still stealing. You receive the grace of God in vain. Somebody was living a licentious life before. A kind of a life, promiscuous life before. A, de a dirty life before. And he says, I have the grace of God, I'm born again, I'm born again. And he's still living a promiscuous life. A defined life, a dirty life. He received the grace of God in vain. Somebody was living a kind of a fraudulent life before, fraudulent business. And now he says, I have the grace of God. I came. I have the gospel. I'm born again. I have the grace of God. And he's still living a fraudulent life. He's still gambling. He's still having all those evil things. And the love of money is eating his heart out. That fellow has not got the grace of God because it says, You receive not the grace of God in vain. You will not receive the grace of God in vain. It will bring a change. It will bring a transformation. He did it in the life of Paul the Apostle. It will do it in your life, in my life, in all our lives together in Jesus' name. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 21. Galatians chapter 2. Verse 21. It says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. See that I do not embarrass the grace of God. I do not put to shame the grace of God. He's looking at the grace of God as a person, a personality. He gives him personality now. He says that this is he comes, it's a transformer. He comes and he's a redeemer. He comes, it's a life changer. He comes, it's a person that turns your life around, and then you say you have accepted him and you have received him, and the grace of God is there. And the change he wants to make, you are not allowing him. You are not allowing him. You are frustrating him. You are frustrating the grace of God. But Paul the Apostle said, for me, the grace of God came to my life. And see the change dynamic. 
and see the change definite and see the change that everybody can even talk about because I do not frustrate the grace of God. And look at verse 20 there. Verse 20, the previous verse, I am crucified with Christ nevertheless I live. Grace came to my life. I am crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I. But Christ lives in me. When Christ comes into your life, grace comes into your life, love comes into your life, mercy comes into your power. The power to live in righteousness comes upon your life. It says, but Christ lives in me. The Christ that will not sing in, he lives in me. The Christ that will be holy, he lives in me. The righteous Christ lives in me. And the Christ that hates sin and hates uh, Satan and hates evil, he lives in me. Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh by the faith of the Son of God, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's after that he now said, you know, I do not frustrate the grace of God. You will not frustrate the grace of God. I said you'll not frustrate the grace of God. When people look at you and they say, but he says he has grace. What kind of grace does he have? If he does not have a change of life in his family, a change of life in his community, a change of life that the villagers and the township people will know about. If he does not have the change of life that his employers will know about and the federal employees will know about, they say, what kind of grace is this? This one is frustrating the grace of God. You'll not frustrate the grace of God. In your school, we'll see the grace of God in you. In your college university will see the grace of God in you. And your family will see the grace of God in your life. In the marketplace will see the grace of God in you in Jesus' name. And look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 15, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. You see that there are some people that think that, you know, grace is there. And whatever I do, wherever I go, whatever I drink, whatever I smoke, whatever I wear, grace is always there. Not at all. Not really. Because it says over here, look diligently. And be very serious about this. If you've got the grace of God, that grace of God should do something wonderful in your life. A transformation in your life, a change in your life. And it says you look diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. I will not fail of the grace of God. I said you will not fail of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. We're looking at First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1. We're reading from verse 13. The grace of God. And here Paul, the apostle, acknowledged the grace of God. That grace of God that comes into our lives and then our sins are forgiven. And then it sets us free. We come totally different and totally distinct from what we were before. First Peter chapter 1 verse 13. It says wherefore get up the loins of your mind. Be sober. And hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not talking about final grace. It talks about initial grace. It talks about continuing grace. And it talks about final grace until we see the Lord face to face. Grace will keep on flowing into our lives. I said grace will keep on increasing in our lives because it says there's a grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, what kind of children are we? As obedient children, what kind of children are you? Tell me out loud now. As obedient children, God will confirm it to your experience in Jesus' name. Not fashioning yourselves according to the format laws in your ignorance. You see what the grace of God does. You saw what it did in the life of Paul the Apostle. Not fashioning himself according to his format laws. He was a persecutor before. Grace came in. He didn't continue a persecutor. 
It was injurious before grace came in. It didn't continue injurious. It was a persecutor before grace came in. It didn't con continue to be a persecutor. And it says, Timothy, that's exactly what grace should do in your life. And then the rest of us, everyone without exception, that's what the grace of God should do in our lives, not fashioning yourselves to your former laws according to your ignorance, but as he which is called you, is holy. So be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy for, tell me, are you holy because of the denomination you attend? I said, are you holy because of the church you attend? Why are you holy? Because the one who saved you, the one who has loved you and the one who sacrificed for you and the one who gave everything for you because he's holy he will not allow sin any form of sin in his life private or public little or small big or common he will not allow any kind of sin in his life it says because i hate sin you hate sin because I'm free from sin, you're free from sin. Because I'm holy, you're holy. It says, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. We're looking at uh, First Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5, uh, I'm reading from verse 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you, be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. And be closed with, tell me out loud. And be closed with, tell me out loud. Can we wear the garment of pride and humility at the same time? No. If the garment of pride is there, the garment of humility is not there. It says we clothe ourselves. We clothe our character. We clothe our behavior. We clothe our disposition. We clothe our attitude. We clothe our interaction with each other. We clothe ourselves with humility. For God resisteth the proud, but tell me, and give it grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that she may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a running lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom receives steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. If you resist the devil, he will flee from you. I said that devil will flee from you. He will not remain with you, will not abide with you in Jesus' name. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 29. The grace of God. Paul the apostle acknowledged the grace of God in his life. And he wants you to understand that the grace of God is what makes you to live that definite changed life, transformed life, a kind of dynamic transformation that comes. And the hand of God and the hand of heaven comes upon your life and you are never the same again and it brings righteousness and it brings freedom and it brings transformation of life and it brings a total change that will be visible evident to everybody around you. Ephesians chapter 4 I'm reading from verse 29 it says let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. That's a change that's a change that's a transformation your heart is changed your tongue will be changed your heart is changed your language will be changed your heart is changed and what comes out of your utterance will be changed. It says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister, tell me, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. It says your interaction, your behavior, your character, if the grace is inside you, should also minister grace to the people you interact with. And it says, grip not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, how many forms of bitterness? How many shapes of bitterness? How many kinds of bitterness? Tell me out loud. 
Let all bitterness, bitterness towards your wife. Let all bitterness, bitterness towards your husband. Let all bitterness, bitterness towards your children. Let all bitterness, bitterness towards your neighbors. That thing happened and then you're bitter. Your tongue is bitter. Your heart is bitter. Your thoughts are bitter. Your interaction is bitter. And your handling them is bitter. It says let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. That's grace. That's grace. When that grace comes in, in our lives, all those negative things will vanish away in Jesus' name. Look at verse 32. Now the result of grace and be ye, tell me, be ye kind, be ye loving, be ye patient, be ye merciful, be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. I pray that this grace will produce such a change in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Point number two now, awakening the gift of God without fear. Awakening the gift of God without fear. We're coming to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 6. It says, wherefore I put thee in remembrance. It says, Timothy, I want to remind you. I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God. You've got the grace of God. Not only that, you've got the gift of God. What are you to do, Timothy? Remember that gift. Awaken that gift. Don't allow that gift to die within you there. Don't allow it to remain dormant. Stop the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. And he said, Timothy, you know, you know the problem? You know the challenge you have? You know what will silence the gift? You know what will kill the gift? You know what will deaden the gift? You know what will kind of uh, make the a gift impotent that it will not have any action at all and any, any, any kind of source at all that will be dynamic and do something? Uh, he said it's a fear. And he said Timothy in verse 7, For God has not given us the spirit of fear. I said God has not given us the spirit of fear. Make it personal. For God has not given me the spirit It's fear that makes you know, people to have gifts and the, fear, the thing is dormant. It's fear that makes them to... In fact, it's not only the gift of God alone. That is the gift you get uh, by the laying on of hands. Think about it. Your salvation is a gift. Righteousness is a gift. Your brain, that's a gift. Your intelligence, that's a gift. The vision, the passion within you, it's a gift. And your purpose of life to say, I'm going to achieve and I'm getting there, is a gift. And the visionary person that has the gift of a vision and he says, I need to get there, I need to get there, all that is a gift. And then the power of the Holy Ghost, that's a gift. The opportunity of remembering brain. This is what you had before and this is the promise of God and you're standing on that promise every time in your life and that's a gift. The ability not to be discouraged and to move on and on and on, sailing on and going on and going through until you achieve, until you get to that goal. That's a gift. All the gifts of God. You know what will paralyze everything? You know, it is fear. Grace, the grace of God grants us the gifts of God, the gift for service and the gift for usefulness. And Timothy had received the gift of grace. He had received the gift of righteousness. He had received the gift of salvation. He had received the gift of the divine nature. He had received the gift for fruitful service. Grace must not become dormant. And then love must not become inactive. You know, see, there are people that have the love of God in their hearts, and that person has a need. The love of God is flowing out. Say, touch him and reach him and touch her and reach her and do something. But what if they reject me? What if they mis misinterpret my action? What if this? What if that? The fear will make the love inactive. The gift of righteousness in your place of work. You know that this is not right. 
this is not uh, acceptable and this is not going to glorify God. But if I talk now, they say, uh huh, he has come again. Holy, holy. He has come again, deeper, deeper. He has come again. And because of the fear of the people, what they are going to say, you cannot stand your ground. And it appears righteousness is dead within you. The passion for souls. That's the gift of God in you. To go everywhere and compel them to come in and preach the gospel to every creature. That passion for souls. You know, if you are, if you are fearful, that passion, that guilt will be stifled and then the zeal will be quenched. Your voice will become silent and the gate will become covered up, useless. You'll not use it again. It will be made impotent, rendered useless. The light you have. If you have fear, it will be put under a bushel. I don't want them to know that, you know, this is what I know. You'll be hiding your knowledge. You'll be hiding your ability. You'll be hiding whatever it is you have. Fear renders grace and gives dormant, useless fear. Fear in the office. When you know how to stand for righteousness. Everybody is talking against corruption. And they say, ah, look at what they have done. Look at what they have done. And when you see corruption trying to take root in your place of work. Now you cannot stand again. You're only reading the papers. You're only talking about you what you read in the papers. But you cannot take your stand and say, this will not be. I will not be part of this. And then you stand out but fear will not allow you. In the family, there are times in the family when some things may be happening and then you know that this is not right. This is not the teaching according to the word of God. But fear will not allow you to open your mouth and sometimes among your friends, you have those friends and those friends and they're doing this and planning this and saying this and that and you have the gift of knowledge right there. You know the writing, you know the chapter, you know the verse and you know the strings of verses you can tell them so that their situation will be arrested but among your friends you are silent you cannot talk because the guilt is stifled and the guilt is quenched by the fear of man sometimes it's in the market in the market where they're selling and they want to do this and that sacrifice or whatever but you know that I, I cannot do this and then they come to you before they come you're saying I will not take part this time because this time now I need to make my stand clear I need to make it clear that I'm a believer I'm a child of God and how they come they send somebody who is forceful and somebody who is you know kind of a, a violent and they say how about it your deal are you going to pay? We want to sacrifice. To tell you point blank. And you are going to pay this amount. And then you are saying inside you, God, what can I do now? What do you do now? You should not be afraid. I will not be afraid. I can't hear my people. You will not be afraid in Jesus' name. They call you deeper. Before they call you deeper, introduce yourself. You say, I am I'm brother deeper. I am sister deeper. I don't do that. I've given my life. I've given my resources. I've given everything I've got. I've surrendered to Christ. I will not surrender to idol, demons, or, or any Satan anymore. In Jesus' name. And then you say, Amen. Amen. They will flee from you. At the time of temptation, you take your stand. In times of opportunities, you know, there are people that have opportunities, but fear will not allow them to run into that path of opportunity and do something. It may be persecution that is uh, after them, uh, and that hinders them. And what the persecution that should lead them into promotion, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Fear will not allow them. They look at the face of Nebuchadnezzar, and you can and see the fury steaming out of the face of Nebuchadnezzar and then they cringe and they crumble and they compromise and fear will not allow them to stand and experience the miracle of being thrown into the fire into the furnace and not being born but from today fear will flee away from you I say fear will flee away from you Fear paralyzes the heart and causes failure. That's why the Lord is reassuring us and saying, I have not received the spirit of fear. 
God has not given me the spirit of fear. I thought you'd say it again. But of power and of love and of a sound mind. And see how that sound mind is so weak. We're going to say that again. For God has not given me the spirit of fear. But of power and of love. And of a sound mind. Uh, you need to read that over and over when you get back home. And every situation that happens, you wake up in the morning and say, Praise the Lord, I'm going out now. I get to the office and I will not fear. I get to the marketplace, I will not fear. I get to the school, I will not fear. I get among friends, I will not fear. I get among persecutors, I will not fear. I've been looking down, fearing them, those persecutors. But now today, I go out and God has not given me the spirit of fear. But he has given me the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind and then when you get out there and anything happens you record it while they're still talking while they're still bragging while they say what they want to start uh, you know what they used to do that to intimidate you in the past you repeat yourself for god has not given me the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind and then you raise up your head and you look at fear face to face and you look at terror face to face they will flee from you in Jesus name uh, look at uh, look at Romans Romans chapter Romans chapter 5 the gift you have got the gift you have got and I pray that this gift will not be stifled or silenced in your life in Jesus name Romans chapter 5 uh, I'm reading from verse 17 Romans chapter 5 verse 17 for if by one man's offense death range by one much more much more they which receive abundance of the grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. You will reign in life. I said you will reign in life. That gift has been given to you. Therefore, that gift will make you reign. In every circumstance you reign. Every situation will you reign. Everywhere you find yourself, you reign in Christ in Jesus' name. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 6. Romans chapter 12, verse 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. You have grace? I said you have grace, then you have gifts. You have gifts. I may not have your gifts. You may not have my gifts. It is a combination of all our gifts together that will fulfill the will of God and will expand the kingdom. And you bring your gifts, there will be no fear anymore. You utilize your gifts in the kingdom, there will be no fear anymore. I mean, then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministry, or he that teaches on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, and he that ruleth with diligence, and he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness you will do it in Jesus name God will use you more than he ever used you before greater fulfillment in your life and greater opportunities will come in Jesus name but remember remember fear will paralyze that fear will stop that and fear will just keep you back and then you'll not be able to do what you are supposed to do but every consecration you make will be useful to the Lord Every surrender you make will be useful to the Lord. And nothing, nothing will silence you anymore in Jesus' name. Are you looking at 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 14? Neglect not the gift that is in thee. Neglect not the gift that is in thee. Remember now that our gifts are different one to the other. If you have the gift of knowledge, don't neglect that. The gift of the doctrines of the Bible that you know it and know it and know it, don't neglect that. The gifts of the Spirit, don't neglect that. The gift of righteousness, don't neglect that. The gift of the grace of God, don't neglect that. Or whatever gift, natural grief that you have, if you neglect it, it will be like your hand 
hang your hand in a bandage. If you hang that hand for a long time, it will become dead, atrophied, and you will not be able to use it anymore. Release those gifts. You are going to be useful. You will climb every mountain. And you will do the will of God in your life in Jesus' name. And all those gifts that are dormant now were waking everything up in Jesus' name. Yeah. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and to the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. I can see that thousands of people are going to get saved through you. I said thousands of people will get saved through you. It will happen in Jesus name. But remember, remember fear must get out of your heart. Out of your soul. Out of your mind. Out of your thinking. What will you fear? The lion of the tribe of Judah is with you. Why will you fear the Lord Jesus Christ that never lost a battle is with you? Why will you fear the one that is said, because I overcame, you too, you will overcome. There's no fear in your heart anymore. Yeah. We're looking at uh, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 14. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. I'm a child of God. I said, I'm a child of God. Then he says, look at verse 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Fear binds you like a cord. It's like, you know, the cord of fear binds your hand, binds your feet, binds your brain, binds your heart, binds your soul, binds your sight. You cannot move. You cannot see anything. If you have fear, no matter how talented you are, no matter how saved you are, and no matter how sanctified you are, and no matter how knowledgeable you are, no matter how determined you are, if fear comes in, you are bound, and you cannot do anything. Life is useless once you allow fear. You cannot do the will of God. You cannot preach the word of God. You cannot touch the lives of people around you. You cannot stand against corruption. You cannot stand against evil. You cannot be a man with a backbone, a woman with a heart of iron. Once fear is there, that's why it says in verse 15, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to, to fear, but you have received, but you have received, tell me out loud, but you have received, the spirit of adoption whereby we cry Abba Father the spirit itself beareth witness with her spirit that we are the children of God and if children, if children if children then heirs heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ if so be that, this, that we suffer with him that we may also be glorified together we'll be glorified together in Jesus name fear is gone I said fear is gone fear is dead fear will not kill you you will kill all your fears fear will not bury you you know, some people, they die alive, and they're still alive, and they're dead. Their brain is dead, their mind is dead, their future is dead, their passion is dead, their zeal is dead, their aspiration is dead, their desires are dead. Fear has killed them. Fear will get out of your life. That fear will die. I said that fear will die. If the fear in you dies, you can climb every mountain. You can get to the zenith of your profession. And you can move on, moving on, moving on, nothing stopping you. I see conquerors there today. I see victors there today. I see overcomers there today. You will bury those fears here before you go today. And then as you are going out, you are going out like a conqueror. 
You say, praise the Lord. Now I'm a joint heir with Christ. Everything God has ordained that I will achieve, I will achieve it in this life in Jesus' name. Philippians, Philippians chapter 1, verse 14. Philippians chapter 1, verse 14. And many of the brethren in the Lord, are they there today? Many of the brethren in the Lord, where are they today? Oh, wonderful. Look at this. Waxing confident by my bonds. I'm much more bold to speak the word. Tell me the last two words. I like to see you on the street without fear. I like to see you in your family without fear. I like to see your place of work without fear. I'd like to see you in the bus rising up and telling the word of God without fear. I'd like to see you talking to those sinners from today without fear. I'd like to just see you walking, even when you're not doing anything and you're walking majestically. And I see, I see somebody there in his brain, there is no fear. In his heart, there is no fear. In his mind, there is no fear. In his vision, there is no fear. And now, boldness will come to your life in Jesus name once again you'll be an achiever once again you'll be victorious once again you're going to succeed and you just, just raise up that and let God anoint that hand for success you'll succeed in Jesus name Point number three, point number three, affirming the gospel in all its fullness. Affirming the gospel in all its fullness. We're coming to, we're coming to 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1, I'm reading here from verse 8. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. That's the gospel. That's the good news. The testimony of our Lord, he died for us. And then he came, he has now sent preachers to us, telling us, I've taken all your sins away. Now you can be confident in life. I've set you free. Now you can be confident in life. I brought the gospel, the good news unto you. Now you can be everything God created you to be. And he says now, you will not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. No, me is prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Look at verse 12. It says, For which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, Timothy, nevertheless, I, Paul, am not ashamed. And I pass it unto you. You are not ashamed. <laughs> Timothy, get that shame out of your life. Looking down out of your life. Walk with confidence, talk with confidence, live with confidence, go through life with confidence because it says, nevertheless, I am not ashamed for I know whom I have believed. Do you know who you have believed? You have started with him, you continue with him. He will see you through. He will take you through. He'll make you to be victorious every time in Jesus' name. It says, I am persuaded. Somebody there, are you persuaded? I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which have committed unto him against that day. The final day of judgment, the Lord will still be with you. And the final day of reckoning, the Lord will still be with you. And because the Lord will be with you. It says, that's why I am not ashamed. You will not be ashamed. I said you will not be ashamed. Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 16. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Why I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why should I? It's good news. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why should I be ashamed? It's the gospel of my salvation. It's the gospel of my redemption. It's the gospel of my deliverance. It's the gospel of my victory. It's the gospel that showed me that Christ left heaven and he came over here on earth and he came for me. He came for me so that he will take me from earth and take me to heaven. Why should I be ashamed? For I am not, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew false and all also to the Greek, I'm not ashamed. 
I said I am not ashamed. You will not be ashamed in Jesus' name. Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1. We're reading from verse 20. Philippians chapter 1, from verse 20. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. Look at that. In nothing I shall be ashamed. To start with, anything that, you know, somebody, let's say, for example, in your office, they change receipt and they do this, they do that. Eventually, they are caught. And the people that are caught, they say, actually, yes, we did it, but we are not alone. Who else is there? And then they mention, God forbid, they will not mention your name. If they mention your name and then they call you from your seat and they said, uh, do you know these people standing? Yes, I know them. Do you know what you've done together? Then you drop your head. They said, lift up your head. What did you do together? And, uh, but you say you are a pastor. And every time you'll be saying, repent, repent. Is this all repentance? Every time you'll be saying, come with us, come with us. God will change your life. Is, that, is this one change? Is this one transformation? And then you're ashamed. I pray that that kind of shame will not happen to you in Jesus' name. <laughs> or maybe a daughter spoke to the father, to the mother, and said, you know, so-and-so was touching me and all that. You don't mean that. That's a holiness preacher. You don't mean that. And then they, you know, for, it's, uh, take, me to, take me to him. I can tell you in his presence. And then they come there, and a the daughter become, begins to talk this upon, this upon. And then you drop your head, and the mother said, my pastor, you did this, and then you say, it's Satan, shame. You will not be ashamed. Anything that will come shame in your life, that somebody will come to ask you, did this happen, did that happen, did that happen, you took that money, you took that thing, you went into that thing, and then you drop your head, and there will be shame from today. Every shame will get out of your life. The Lord will cleanse your life, make you righteous, and make you holy. In your office, you will stand like this, your shoulders up, and you look at everybody's face, you say, praise the Lord, the blood of Jesus, and make me cleaner, and kept me clean. In your community, the blood of Jesus has made me clean, and kept me clean. Shame never again. I said never again. It says in that chapter 1 verse 20 that in nothing I shall be ashamed but that with all boldness as always, all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body whether it be by life or by death. It's saying even if I will die, I will not do anything that will bring shame. I said, even if you will die, you will not do anything that will bring shame in Jesus' name. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And to die is gain. For those who do not live right, look at what will happen on the final day. Daniel, Daniel chapter 12. And I'm reading from verse 2. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. And many of them that, that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life. That's where I am. I said that's where I am. That's where you'll be in Jesus' name. And some to shame and everlasting contempt. They are shamed over here, ashamed over here, ashamed over there. And then when they get to the other side, you had all those messages who are not saved. You had all those messages who are not sanctified. You had all those messages and you were not transformed. Then they drop their head and it will be shame and everlasting contempt. But you, look at yourself in verse 3. But they that be wise, I said this, I'm looking at you here. I said, I see you here. The Lord will confirm it in Jesus' name. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. I cannot wait until that time I'll see you a star. I see the crown on your head. I see stars in your crown. 
I see everlasting joy in your life. And then you'll see me as well as I will see you. We'll be together in that everlasting place in Jesus' name. Today, the opportunity is there. The grace of God can come more into our lives. The gift of God can be pronounced more in our lives. And the gospel in all its fullness can take residence in our lives. And from today, we'll live a life that will change this world and turn this world around and transform every bad thing around us and cleanse the corruption around us away. Everywhere we go now, we'll be agents of cleansing and righteousness and holiness and purity in Jesus name and on the final day you will shine beyond your expectation rise up and tell the Lord rise up and tell the Lord you'll make it by the grace of God you'll make it by the grace of God the grace of God will not live your life the grace of God is multiplying and it's available today acknowledge that grace of God and the gift of God is available and then the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in his fullness available for you today you will now be totally transformed you're not going to go out the way you came it changed it changed a transformation in your life